Any of y'all in District 5? All right, we've got a few. Awesome. Um, we're not in District 5 right now, that's because I kind of thought we'd have to need a larger room than I have available in District 5. That's why we're in the library. Um, but thank you all for being here. Uh, these town halls, I set them up mainly so that we can have uh, the residents of Athens-Mark County, especially of my district, be able to interact with your county government directly, um, be heard, and be part of the policy and governing experience that we all have. And just, uh, this is, you know, we work for y'all, so I want to make sure that we're accessible. And so that's the idea here. We kind of focus this on different department or issue or policy every month. And of course, this month, um, as you all are very aware of, we're here for animal control. Um, recently, we've had you know, some issues that we've definitely experienced that have made it obvious that we need to have some changes when it comes uh, to our animal services, our animal control department. And um, I invited uh, Mandy Williams to be here with us. Uh, and also, uh, I want to make sure that the service providers for this area, the animal service providers and people who do volunteering, we're also represented here too. So we have uh, Lisa, is it the no? Am I pronouncing it? Wow. My, okay, sorry. Uh, with, with Athens Pets and, uh, and James Stewart with Athens Area Humane Society. Um, so that we can have that perspective too. Um, so I mean, the, the, the commission, uh, beyond myself, the entire commission definitely has been taking this issue very seriously and want to make sure that the animals and the residents of Athens Park County are getting the quality service that they deserve. Um, so we're taking this very seriously and acting on many things, which uh, you'll hear uh, in the coming minutes. The most important, I think, being that many of y'all have already heard that we are going to be voting next week on uh, breaking animal services, not animal control, actually calling animal services, uh, out into its own department, often uh, when it was previously under central services so that we can make sure that we have a department head there who has the expertise needed to lead a department like that, and also so we can have more uh, direct oversight from the county manager's office. Um, so uh, with all of that, um, I'm first just going to ask uh, at Lisa to start us off. And Lisa, what I would love if you could do is just uh, tell us all a little bit about what Athens Pets does, first and foremost, and then also talk about uh, your relationship with animal control, um, what do you feel like has worked, what hasn't worked, and where you'd like to see that relationship going as it moves forward. Okay, thanks so much, Tim, for both putting this together and for having us here um, tonight. So Athens Pets is an all-volunteer 501c3 organization that works to get the animals out of animal control alive and works to um, reduce pet overpopulation in the Athens area. And to that end, we have a website. So if you've ever seen animals from the shelter on a website, that's volunteer run. Um, a volunteer started, Allison, who was here, started that in 2001, and so all of the pictures and content on that website, AthensPets.net, are provided by volunteers. Um, and so that website helped considerably in reducing the, uh, the number of animals that were being euthanized at the shelter each year uh, until 2015 when I incorporated Athens Pets and made it a 501c3 and we started raising funds to take care of the unusual medical needs of the shelter animals uh, as well as providing for a community spay neuter program to try and reduce the pet overpopulation problem more generally. So we've worked closely with animal control for a number of years uh, as volunteers. I started volunteering at the shelter in about 2009 when I, I moved here in 2007 and I think it took me about a year and a half before I actually started spending time at the shelter. And so we've had a great relationship through the years and been able to work closely on a lot of things. But as you all know, it's been a little bit rockier in the last year and a half where we've tried to work within the county structure to help resolve what we see as systemic issues that have been there for a while, um, but kind of came to the surface. And um, in the last month or so, I feel like we have a lot of reason to be hopeful that this relationship is one that is moving ahead where we can all collaborate and have a strong relationship um, we're still, uh, Blaine will talk about some of the things that we've come together as stakeholders to discuss and to propose to the commission to hopefully adopt, um, but a lot of that has come from the people in this room who have offered their ideas to the rest of us. Um, and so we're hoping that we'll keep moving ahead and that um, the sort of issues we've seen in the last year and a half will be a thing of the past and that we'll be able to um, get back to just making Athens the I don't know, I feel like we could really be a, a strong example in the Southeast. We are so close to having something that 
that is incredibly strong between who we have as staff members, who we have as volunteers, who our community is, that um, I think that we need to get there and that we're finally back on track to do that. Fantastic. Thank you, I really appreciate that. And uh, Jane, kind of is, uh, the same thing, if you can talk about what role y'all play here and how you interact with us. Sure, um, I'm Jane Stewart and I'm the Executive Director at Athens Area Humane Society. We are a nonprofit. Um, we have a rescue side and we also are adoption side and we also have a low cost spay neuter um, program at our facility. And we actually do the um, we alter all of the animals that are adopted from, or most of the animals that are adopted from Clark County. So we work, we see, we we have contact every day for the most part, um, Monday through Thursday. We also pull from Clark County to. Um, our main goal is to cut down on the number of healthy adoptable animals that are euthanized. So uh, we we do work with other counties as well. We pull from other animal controls, but. I would say Clark County is certainly our primary um, area that we pull from, and we've also done some targeted spay-neuter programs inside Clark County where we have um, looked at the data, areas where more animals are coming into animal control. We've gotten some grant money to offer free spay-neuters for those zip codes within Clark County. So we're really trying to help, help you know, keep the number that come into animal control down. Um, we also work with Athens Pets, and, and sometimes we alter animals that have not been adopted but are, are going to be up for adoption, and Athens Pets um, sponsors those. So that's um, part of what we do. I think we have a, I think we, I've been there five years and are here five years, and I think we have a very good relationship with, um, with animal control. And we try to be a support system for them. We have a medical director that's on staff that can can offer advice, you know. And, and some of the issues in the last couple of years, you know, it, it it always comes to us whenever because we we share volunteers that volunteer for you know Clark County and Adams Vets, and they they come to our place too. And and also when we're coming in to um, pull, and it's always better if they're healthy for sure. So. Uh, you know, I, I'm excited about the things that are happening now, and I feel like this, I, I know that we can be a, a, a good standard for the Southeast. You, you all know that we do not have a very good reputation in the Southeast, and so it takes a whole lot of um, combined efforts from rescues and not, you know, nonprofits as well as animal control to, to really make it a good place for animals to be. We have a wonderful community here. They've been very supportive of us, and I know that you all have been very supportive of Animal Control and trying to help help and volunteer there. So I, I think we can do this. Thank you so much. Um, and also, uh, before uh, Manager Williams uh, speaks, I just want to recognize that we also have uh, Assistant Manager uh, Josh Edwards back there, uh, who stopped in with us, and along with uh, Commissioner Russell Edwards, who, who's back there. And also Commissioner Melissa Link here. Like I said, I mean, uh, the commission is definitely de very dedicated to, to making sure this this gets fixed and we have uh, what we need. Um, but with that, if you'd like to go ahead, Andrew, Williams. sure. Would you? <clears throat> and past Commissioner, oh, yeah, it's true, definitely. Yes. Um, so first off, uh, no doubt many of you have volunteered or helped at the shelter and are concerned and interested in what direction is going forward. And I want to thank you. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm the manager of Lane Williams. Uh, I work for the mayor and commission, and uh, I'm in charge of running the day-to-day -day operations of the government through the department. Has. So I wanted to thank you all for what you do at the shelter. Um, come to understand a lot more in recent days and weeks about the, uh, the symbiotic relationship between the animal shelter animal control for that matter, and, and some of our stakeholder agencies that we've begun to talk with. Um, one of the issues was sort of the structure of it. It was a division of a department, so it was sort of one level removed from the manager's office, uh, which is no excuse, I mean, we need to know what's going on. But I think in, if the commission decides to elevate it to departmental status, we will be involved a lot more closely as we are right now. And I think it's worthy of that. Um, it's important. It's an important service that we provide the citizens and the animals of this county, and it deserves our attention. Um, so I'm hopeful that the mayor commission will, will approve that. 
And as Commissioner Denson said, we're going to change it to Department of Animal Services because not only is control sort of a negative connotation, there's a much richer story about what's going on with the animals or should be going on with the animals. And so it's, it's maybe a nuance, but I think it's important. Uh, some of the immediate things that the commission is considering is um, what's abundantly clear over the last year and a half is we've, we've had issues with, with staffing. Uh, and, and, and so we, we have added some part-timers here and there. But you know, in a good economy, it's hard to get part-time work, and it's yeah. tough work at the shelter. And so converting those to full-time, so two animal caretakers, two part-time animal caretakers, to two full-time animal caretakers, we hope we can attract a candidate that will stay with us, you know, retain that institutional knowledge, build the relationships with the rescuers and others, so that we have some, some consistency of our issues. Um, additionally, we want to uh, make the, the volunteer coordinator convert that from part-time to full-time because it's obvious that type of relationship management is vital to, again, continuous um, excellence. The other, with, the, with going to a department, the other meaningful thing about that is that the department director, again, will be interfacing with uh, the manager's office, um, will be able to pay more and hopefully attract a professional who can do all of the operations and manage the relationships and market in the community, you know, to tell the good story about the things that are going on out there. The other thing too, it was clear as, as, as Josh and I got more involved in, in sort of looking at what's going on or not going on, uh, and our partners, uh, and I say our partners, um, you know, there are lots of partners, so it's not an exclusive um, invitation list, but we started with some of the major folks that we work with. What was not going on was there was no formalized relationship, and it's evolved over time. I think it was back in 09 that, that, that the Humane Society took care of the cats, and then that fell to the, the county. Um, there's a lot of great work going on. We're having turnover in staff. There's nothing in writing about what exactly is to do and when to do it and who to tell. And so I think that we would all benefit from formalizing those relationships and being transparent about who's doing it. Um, in doing that, we want to ask our stakeholders, because they are knowledgeable of best practices, that they help us with our policies and procedures and make sure that we're doing that, that the structure of the policies and procedures is sound. That's the first step. And so full transparency on cleaning regimens, on vaccinations, and things of that nature. Now, the second most important thing is being accountable to those things actually happening when they're supposed to happen. And I've come to understand that our shelter management software is an access database that was created by a past director that is very problematic. And not only is it problematic, it also makes the volunteer work more difficult uh, for identifying animals. And I've learned from Jane and Lisa that there's a product called Pet Play, which the Humane Society uses, I think the Coney County uses it, um, and it's much more robust and it would make life easier on you know, posting animals and not having to have somebody do that. And in using that, I'm told, I'm not an expert in that, but that will help give us accountability on, you know, apparently it has features like it will email reminders about vaccinations, set vaccinations that need to occur and things of that nature. Now that can only improve things. Okay, so getting the right policies, procedures in place, that making sure adequate training is happening, and then the staff um, being accountable to making sure things are getting done. And uh, I will tell you that, that Assistant Manager Edwards has met with all the staff as of today individually, and they want to be held accountable. They just want some structure in place, and they want uh, you know to be able to be consistent in, in doing it because they the staff does care. Um, now, in moving forward with our partners, um, the first thing that we're doing is sort of a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats with both the staff and our, our partners to understand because, you know, this is fairly urgent work. And so what are the priorities we need to address first? So we're going to go through that process, and that is not a month-long process, y'all. I mean, we're going to knock that out in the next 30 days or so. Um, as I said, we're going to formalize our roles and responsibilities. Uh, we talked about the organizational structure alternatives. Um, 
it was clear that being buried in a department, a division of the department, was not helpful. And so it came to my mind, well, maybe we should go ahead and make it a department. But if we're going to be true in our new partnership, I wanted to consult the stakeholders. You know, what are some best practices out there? Are there hybrid models of how we might run this operation? And at a recent meeting, the group, um, and, and, and just so you know who I'm talking about, Athens Pets, Humane Society, Three Paws, Circle of Paws, and Campus Cats. Circle of Friends. Circle of Friends, sorry. <laughs> 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 Athens Canine Rescue. So these are the major players as we as understand it. And they reaffirmed that no, the county very much needs to do this. We don't need to break any functions apart. We don't need to privatize the shelter. And again, this was part of my education. Uh, they are. Uh, I won't speak for y'all, but what I heard at the meeting was they're very glad that we're an open commission shelter, that we don't turn animals away, and that, that we should retain that feature. Okay. So we got to do that. Talked to the mayor commission and said. I think we're all on board with creating this department, and so that's where we are. Now, so we start, you know, what we're hoping to come out of this, the SWOT analysis is some priorities that we need to address up front. And I want to tell you from what I've heard, it's cleaning protocols, it's vaccinations, and we need to do some process mapping. We need to understand who's supposed to do what, and, and make that very clear. Document any changes that are made, evaluate those changes, and then adopt them. So there's a process. These are processes that aren't necessarily going on, okay? And it's not sexy and it's not rocket science. It's just paying attention and making sure that folks are involved. Above all, the communication is going on. And we've been asked for transparency. Uh, you know, animal care outcomes is important. We need to develop some key performance indicators you know, one of the things I've heard in our, our discussion is uh, the methodology of determining what is an unwanted animal or unadoptable. And I can't pretend to understand that, but we're going to develop that methodology and that will be transparent. And then we need to follow that uh, as, as closely as we can. So key performance <laughs> indicators, uh, you know, accountability, implementing these uh, changes, uh, animal care outcomes, you know, tracking those and uh, benchmarking with other shelters, right? Because there are models that are not so good. We need to find some good aspirational shelters and see how we stack up against them going forward so that we all understand we're not just looking at data in one silo. Um, so what we'd like to do is do a strategic plan with our partners and staff input and share that with y'all about what some changes are going to be made with milestones we can all track so that you know, it won't be an overnight change to be gradual. And I agree with Lisa. Most of our departments are models in the state, and there's no reason animal services should not be that. One other thing I'd like to mention is, you know, we all need to have a common purpose. And I think we all have the same goals in mind, but but I sitting with the partners, we talked about, and y'all let me know if I forgot anything, but you know, not in this order, but you know, protecting the public from dangerous animals. Um, protecting animals from inhumane treatment, um, educating animal owners about care, um, housing and caring for animals that are in our possession with our partners, um, <coughs> convey them to caring homes, and then the campus cat shot is alter them and return them to their territory or colony. So those are the, the, the things that we said, this is what we agree on, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And so now that's the what, and we're going to begin working on the how. So, so. Blaine, do you have a, 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 a bit of a timeline for the strategic plan when you, you guys are thinking about seeing that done? Sure. So, um, and again, I, I want to brag on my new hire, Josh Edwards, who comes to us from Durham, North Carolina. And his specialty is strategic planning and innovation and performance measures. So, just the man for the job. Um, we'll do the SWATs in the next three weeks, uh, 30 days. Uh, then we have to come up, as he's educating me, with overarching objectives we're trying to achieve. No doubt, I just listed those for you. Um, then there are action items we want to develop with the partners and the staff that address these weaknesses and opportunities and threats. Uh, you develop performance measures once you know the action items. 
and then we review and agree on the draft plan. There'll be a presentation to the commission at a work session televised, and then um, we present to the commissioners for their acceptance. And so, timeline wise, that's probably that's probably four months, I would guess, um, just to get through all that. But it'll be done in full view. Question. I didn't notice, I didn't hear anybody mention um, the problem with UGA college students adopting pets and then turning them loose when they either move or graduate, and that's a huge contribution to the problem of stray dogs and cats and after Every year I like talk for it, but it's like the letting loose of the pets. That should be on that list of things to address. I can actually address that somewhat because the data doesn't show that that's what happens. We don't have the spikes in the impounds of stray animals in May that would correspond to that. We also don't have it in December. Actually, December is a fairly low impound month. April does start to pick up some, but June, July, and August are much higher. We're not seeing the animals that correspond with the semester schedule. There's undoubtedly some that that happens with, but I don't know that that's as big of a problem as unaltered pets. For example, in most communities you're going to have about 80% of our pets are altered. And what we see the animals coming into animal control is exactly the opposite, where 80% are not altered. And so we see the problem. The spikes we see are corresponding to new litters in many ways, where people trading in their year and a half old dog for a puppy. And it's not actually, from what we've seen in the data, as tied to college students as you might think. Yeah, I, I would like to raise something that's been on my mind for a long time. It's maybe tangential to this, but it's relevant. Um, anybody, it seems, can put an ad in the Banner Herald for the flagpole and give away their dog. Stay, not stay, California. And I would love to see, and I think California has this, has instituted this, where the newspaper will offer a free ad, okay, if your dog is licensed and spayed and so forth and so on. And if you are just giving your dog away, there would be a hefty fee for the ad. That's just one suggestion, but it's definitely a black hole. The newspapers are a black hole for unwanted, you know, pets. Well, if I, if I might real quick. This is a conversation that, that y'all no doubt had before, but we, really, we, need, we need to talk about this. And certainly don't want to create any political issues with the Mayor and Commission, but we're talking about a very reactive approach. Uh, and I, I want to applaud the work that, that your organizations do in actually bringing resources to all your animals. You know, we need to get to a point where we have many more altered animals than not. And, 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 and again, I'm learning that there's, there's seasonal times to be uh, intentional about that. And I, I think, Jane, you told me y'all got the grant. And, and, uh, We've got two grants to help with altering, pre-altering, altering for people who live in those specific areas of Clark County. But okay. and we, we've, never, we've never had that. We take our animals back. So as far as the going back to the college students, and I've never seen a big influx of returned animals. We do chip all of our animals, so we would know if somebody did that, right? Because if Animal Patrol picked them up, typically they'll call they us. To the no, but Animal Patrol's going to end up picking them up in the field. Um, and, and they would be all of them, too. So I don't think, does Animal Patrol chip all of theirs? At this point, they should. Uh, they don't chip the ones going to rescues, but our local rescue partners right. all chip them. Uh, they chip all the adopted and even right. refunds at this okay. point. And sometimes the students take them to like Japan's home where they'll be adopted by the farmer and they'll be fine and living there. But it's not legitimate. Any of them will be turned up a lot. So, did, were you following up on this one or else? I am. Okay. <laughs> I am. So, it did hurt. Y'all didn't. Do, and I understand the problems because it did people that are going to involve a involved newspaper. But I do see that as a critical piece in if we're going to uh, make Athens the humane community that we all want to be. We have to put a litter in the banner character what the flag called to give away. What's, who's accountable for that? That's 
I and I think that would be something I would think that the paper would have to, you know, they would have to have that role that, you know, Maybe. And maybe they could reach out to us, or you know, certainly they could reach out to us to get the animals altered before they were in there. It starts with private citizen going to the newspaper and asking them to do that. Other than start with the law so much, but the problem is that we see all the online and those aren't going to be affected. They're all free anyway. The the Facebook posts, the Facebook groups that are all about breeding and selling. Oh, so it's in control, but low budget and Craigslist and everywhere else. But I believe in that. Yeah, I can talk to them. So that's what I need to do is yep. go up there and. Okay, so what what is this a partnership then? Could this be considered a potential partnership in the paper? How would I approach that? I guess I'm asking your suggestion. Well, you said that you'd seen this in other communities. California, I believe, has has had this you know long-standing uh, law, I guess, or agreement, I guess. Let me take off your model and show it to them. So yeah, I think I think the best thing to do. Yeah, we can so research. As a private citizen, yeah, probably. I mean, yeah, because again, the flagpole and banner are both private entities. Then, yeah, but I think that may be direction. Um, okay, so we had a few more questions up. Um, Paul, did you have one? Um, I mean, I suggested years ago, if there's a problem with having enough personnel to fix animals. I, for one, volunteered. I'm sure there'd be other folks, and I mentioned this to a bet and a few other people, and they were all outraged that I had the audacity to offer my services, not having been through 10 years of college and vet school or what have you. But every farm boy I've ever met has castrated animals in a compassionate and skillful manner without killing them. So that's suggestion one. Would there be a way to enlist the help of the community to assist veterinarians in this endeavor? For free, I mean, of course. The other thing is more of a question. I mean, I know that their birth control methods that last for a few months, maybe a few years for women, does the same thing exist for animals? And if so, could that be done for free or for real cheap? And to continue the thought, if the answer is yes, is it possible, and again, I'm willing to volunteer, to... Um, just to run an ad saying, we will visit you to, to fix your animals, spay, neuter, alter, whatever the term is. To alter your animals, just let us know when you'll be there. We'll come out with the necessary equipment. And if it's just an injection, it might be quick and easy and cheaper in the long run than dealing with an overabundance of unwanted pets. And this is I'll talk about one thing also, just like how well people can volunteer with those organizations. And then if you want to talk about... Yeah, I we couldn't. You have to be a vet to do, <laughs> to do the surgery for sure. But, but we do take volunteers that help. You know that is our spay neuter program. It operates Monday through Friday, Monday through Thursday. Sometimes we have Fridays, but um, and we have people that come in and help wrap wrap packs or you know that kind of thing. Um, watch the animals when they're recovering on the. But a, a licensed vet always does the surgery and. And we we would always want that to be the case. There is a <clears throat> there is a form of um, birth control. Yeah, it's it's you can alter an animal with with chemi yeah with chemicals, yeah. but Zutering. it's called zootering. And uh, there have been some different thoughts on that as far as how it. Um, <laughs> no. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, it doesn't help so much with some of the behavioral issues that animals can have, and it, it's only for males, as far as I know. I don't think they can do that. Yeah, well, there we, we have a vet in here. You can tell us about that, but um, I know when I worked for another rescue, we did did some, but it, it, it hasn't been a really popular. It's been a lot of tissue reactivity afterwards, right. and, and, uh, and also you have to worry about are all the cells dead, are we still secreting? Right. You know, just and it's about the same price, dude. It's not a cheap well, Is that chemical you're referring to? I'm referring to birth control, the female yeah, pets. Yeah, I don't know. I don't that know that about that. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't work for a lot of people. Right. Thanks, Doug. Okay. Um, we've just got another hour, and we haven't really talked much about the shelter. So, what we hope. Um, 
I have a couple of things I wanted to ask about. First of all, the Humane Society does a fabulous job with the spay neuter, but we have such a problem in Park Neuter. There's so many cats that need, you know, ferals and, and strays that need to be fixed. And I feel like what we really need, because now they also have to implement an appointment process. So for me, as somebody who might track a cat, you know, I can track one and then find I'm stuck with it for the next three weeks or whatever, because I can't get them. Yeah. So what we could really do with is a vet at the animal control to do spay neuter and to oversee all of these, you know, various medical issues. Um, and then the other related thing about med medical stuff is that, you know, if you catch a feral kitten, you can guarantee it's got another respiratory infection, an eye infection, and worms, at the very least. Oh, probably spring worm. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, and I don't see why that happens to pets is having to raise money and spend money on basic treatments that these animals should be getting, those things and other you know, like antibiotics or whatever, when they come into the shelter and or on an ongoing basis. So I feel like the county needs to, and I realise the problems we've been having are really management problems more than anything, but we need to put more money into this so that we can have it there and we can ha do more spay neuter and try and cut the problem off at the you know, point of where it starts, but also to help the, the animals that are in the shelter, both cats and dogs. So that's, those are great points, and um, and I don't disagree. Uh, and that would be part of this plan that we're coming out with. We would identify uh, certain solutions, and we would put numbers to them. And then, you know, so that there, this is important that the, the mayor commission don't adopt the plan; they accept the plan. They're saying, okay, we understand this is good work, and they reserve the right to kind of decide, you know, because you got to do things across the county about which ones they'll do, but at least through the formalization of our roles, how can we work better together? You know, what is creating a tremendous amount of drag on our partners that we can pick up? You know, those are the conversations that we're going to have, the numbers to it, prioritize them, and then come to budget year, which by the way, y'all, budget discussions start in a couple of months. The Mayor Commission adopts the budget uh, in June. It takes effect July 1st, which is starting to start year. So this is a good time. You know, over the next four months, we will identify these things, and then we can know what what the you know kind of emergent uh, resources we need to apply to, and that could very well be part of the solution. But I agree with you, and that goes back to what I said before. We need to get to where we're altering more animals. Either pet owners doing that. We certainly can't. Y'all can't do it all by yourself. Maybe we're helping too. And maybe there's more. Animals. But I, I agree with you, we got to get ahead of the problem. <laughs> yeah. Around 20 years ago, there was so many cats in Athens, Georgia, that the feline leukemia virus mutated into an actual different virus. And it wiped out all the cats. Because I was volunteering, I worked at the vet school, blah, blah, blah. And I finally talked to one veterinarian who actually knew Dr. Lappin, who did a study on why that happened. So that's a point. A second point is that we are next door to Madison County, which is a very large agricultural, I think it's largest in North Georgia. Okay. I don't think people are aware how far a cat can go. Okay? okay. Madison County's issue with cats is controlled by coyotes. So they don't have an issue with that out there. But, and I have a friend who does wildlife rescue, and she and I talked when I could say to her, well, why does this happen? And understanding the behavior of an animal, of a species, and understanding how far they go. I have just recently moved into Athens from the county, and even though I have studied animal behavior forever, living in the city was the first time I realized that dogs communicate with each other and we have no clue. And I mean, my dog will let me know that there's an animal coming. There's a woman named Temple Brandon who, her books explain that dogs can tell that there's another dog coming and whether or not it has a leash on it or not. So she's a great 
place if anybody wants to understand issues. She's a wonderful source. She's 75 years old, she's autistic. Okay, she's worked with animals forever. As far as trying to have a, and I want to say that it's wonderful to think about how they're doing it in California, but we definitely are not in California. And I love hearing how other places are helping in making that game. And I think it's a matter of adopt, listening to that idea, which is great, and trying to figure out how to juggle it so that we end up with healthy dogs, healthy cats, and we don't all have to come, you know. So, thank you. Um, I just want to also point out that um, I'm, I'm Melissa Link, I'm on the commission, and I'm chair of the audit committee. And um, the audit committee has recommended a operational analysis of the animal shelter. Um, and we've expanded that. We initially recommended it last year after the incidents last year, and it ended up getting postponed, and we were told that most of the issues had been resolved um, in the sheriff's department audit that was expanded bigger than we expected and the transition to a new commission um, had that going on longer than expected. Um, but we just voted to revive that recommendation for an audit for the, the animal shelter. Um, and we've expanded it to also include um, a financial and budgetary element. So um, our, our audit can take a deeper dive into not only the operations, but the budgeting for the department to make sure that you know we are properly funding this department and the funds are going where they need to go. Um, I also want to point out that um, you know as elected official, I I hope that we will have some discussions about new ordinances on how to control the population. We know every year the population goes up, and we know why because puppies are born and kittens are born, and the only way to stop that is some mass bay and neuter programs and I, you know, I am all for exploring legislation that makes it mandatory or strongly encourages spaying and neutering um, and other means of controlling it. I mean, I, I know as a pet owner myself, I mean, my pets, I don't have children, so my pets are the center of the universe. Um, you know, people will go above and beyond to take care of their pets, and there are resources out there for those who are unable to afford it to make sure that, you know, just because you might be on a low income status doesn't mean that you don't deserve to have a pet in your family. Um, so I, I think that, you know, having that outside independent analysis from our auditor can also bring some new ideas to the table, can take a look at what other communities are doing, and can also, um, you know, get to a deeper dive into the fiscal and budgetary issues that um, kind of brought us where we are today. And Melissa, if I'm correct, we're going to be voting on that also on Tuesday, right? Yes. Except it has, but yeah. Can I actually ask a question of Melissa about the audit? Um, so, what would the prospective time horizon be on completing the audit? Like, to what extent it would enough be done that it could play into the revisions that we're talking about? Because it would be nice to figure out the stuff that volunteers don't know or county management doesn't know or people who have been at the shelter a long time might just not see anymore because, you know, it's what you do every day, both the good and the bad, because yeah. we don't want to throw out the good. Yeah, well, and, we had some discussion of that in the audit committee, and being that, you know, so much has already been revealed through this incident, last year's incident, and through the work that y'all have been doing, um, you know, we feel like the auditor could not, you know, a substantial audit out within, you know, a few months once she gets started, um, and she's ready to do some of that preliminary work, you know, as soon as we give the go ahead on Tuesday night. Um, and I know that, you know, Russell's on the committee too. Um, you know, we've had some discussions about, you know, what we'd like to see come out of it, and, and you know, what we could propose. You know, depending on what she comes up with, but also doing that research and finding out what is done in, in other communities and, and really making some laws here in Evans Clark County that will solve the problem, that not just you know deal with a, you know offer up solutions for the problem, but that actually solve the problem at its core. <coughs> My question kind of deals with the, the law and the ordinance that we're about, and you kind of made mention of it earlier that the problem wasn't so much you didn't really feel like college students were the issue, but um, that perhaps people taking pets and returning them. And I'm wondering if, if you guys have any idea, like, implementing some sort of restrictions on people who 
or like say working at senior dogs and then turning around and like picking out a puppy to take with them. I see it a lot as a as an issue in other areas. I don't think that's so much of an issue here in Athens, Georgia, but we've seen a lot of it um, media and that sort of thing. And I feel like it's sort of an unfair process and not a very good way of educating people about um, prevention as a, you know, spay and neuter is the main way, but there are other ways to educate people as far as prevention. Um, and one of them would be, would be to not allow them to take cuts that they shouldn't be taking. <laughs> well, we would not take in a senior. We, we're we limited in mission, so we get to pick and choose what comes in. But um, if someone surrenders a dog, we would not let them turn in and adopt a, a puppy. That you know, that would you have some way of? Well, I mean, you know, maybe we turn around and come back a month later. Right, but we do have a list, you know, and we know by someone's name, and it's at that point. <laughs> right. So, so we do have. We haven't. I have never. I don't think I've ever had that happen. You know, I'm not saying it doesn't happen because I'm sure it does, but um, people can go to animal control and just turn their animal in. So, right. you know, that that would be a whole different. But we we do work diligently trying to educate the public, and um, and I know Lisa does a lot a lot with that too in, in Clark County, and we also have a we have a food bowl for uh, people who are having a hard time feeding their animals. You know. Um, that they can easily get get food to help them. If that helps keep their animal, but we we also, if somebody's coming to us for food for an animal, we make sure that they're altered. And if they're not, obviously, if they don't have money for food, they don't have money to get the animal fixed. So sure. we, we work that in and, and we do those services. Um, also, if somebody to, like brings in a litter of puppies to us um, and they're keeping the parent dog, we it's mandatory that they get that. We don't take the puppies unless they have enough space. Okay. So, you know, and the father too, if they have it. So, I actually wanted to address your question with respect to the actual ordinances. So, in addition to running out of the pets, I'm a block professor at the UGA, and I um, teach us clinic because the practical and animal welfare skills where my students work with the animal control officers, the county attorney's office, and the solicitor's office on the animal offenses in the county. And so, in that with that hat on, I'm actually quite familiar with the ordinances that we have locally. And right now, as Melissa said, a lot of them actually need to be overhauled. We have a, our ordinances were for the most part drafted maybe 10 years ago or so, when the situation was very different. The um, Many more animals were being killed at the shelter, and so the focus was on just trying to get that down in any way they can. And so there's really no restrictions in the ordinances themselves on adoption, and I think that's one thing that needs to be updated both in terms of specifying when people can't adopt, and then also making adoption better for the people who are actually good adopters. Because right. there are some issues with that process as well. There are internal guidelines that animal control has that says that they should generally not adopt people who have a history of animal control violations and that the person should be able to show on the face of the application that they have the ability to care for the animal for its lifespan. But in practice, that part doesn't really get has not historically at least been very well policed. So we've seen somebody come in with a dog and just surrender it and say he wants a dog with a bigger head. And he immediately puts in an application for a different dog and walks out with that dog. And so we definitely see in practice that there are no constraints, but this is one reason why we really need to overhaul uh, both the formal ordinances to cover breeding, adoption, neglect in the community, things like that, enforcement level things, but then also the internal guidelines, and then, like Wayne was saying, to train people on them and then hold them accountable. Because while people can override the guidelines, they should be writing a memo and explaining why, in this case, this person has shown that, in fact, it's not a problem. I frankly surrendered a number of animals to the shelter, not ones I would say are my personal animals, right. um, but where somebody has nothing to do, had no way to deal with an animal on a Sunday night, and they give me the animal. Yeah. And so that was, so I would be barred from adopting if it was bright. <coughs> Um, and so that's, they should have some discretion, but there should be explanations of discretion. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and building on that, do you all see uh, with the development of the strategic plan, uh, policy recommendations coming out of that also? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and just, uh, yes, sorry. Uh, so what would happen is learning from our partners and listening to everyone, what do we need to address? 
and then the mayor will refer that to one of two committees, standing committees, that five commissioners each serve on. And they really, that's where they get a deeper dive into what the need is and what the language needs to look like, the attorney works with them. And that's recommended to the full commission for adoption. And that's how we do ordinance changes. So I fully expect the strategic plan to uncover here's some policy areas that need to be approved. Yes, ma'am. There's a lack, a lack of urgency with regards to filling open staff positions. It's been identified as a big problem, um, a big issue with the problems at Apple Control. I heard that a part-time animal control officer put in her notice last week, but the position has not been posted as of this afternoon. I understand that part-time positions can be posted as soon as the employee gives notice. Who's responsible for initiating job postings and why are they delayed? If you're talking about a four-month timeline time for things to be putting in, that the shelter is already without you know, We'll be without someone for that. Sure. Well, um, the shelter, oh, well, Animal control management and human resources are jointly responsible for posting the decision. I can't speak to that. I don't have personal knowledge of that, but I can certainly look into that. Okay. Yes, sir. I, just, I will say, too, that uh, I think an offer has been made for a shelter supervisor, and so hopefully that decision will be made shortly. Just wanted to point out that uh, Madison Overport Shelter is right next door. They do have a veterinary clinic, um, so they could be a model might look at to see how they make it work um, and also there is training available through NACA for example for shelter staff in the last few years the uh, management over there has had no interest it seems in taking advantage of that but I think that you know the people that you hire there should be funding available and some requirement for continuing education Good one. Sure. Um, yes. Oh, okay. Read my prepared question. So this is kind of like a burning question that I personally had for the last few months now. Um, so the county stated in a press release that a family outbreak that led to the needless killing of nearly an entire shelter of cats and kittens was confirmed. That information has since been written <laughs> as false. As we now know, not a single cat or kitten that was killed at the shelter had been confirmed as actually having the virus. So my question is, in the county's August 29th press release, the county quoted that staff made the decision to kill the cats and kittens. Will you please explain who you meant by staff? Were you indicating that a person in addition to the shelter administrator, the shelter, in the call. How broad the chain of command did that decision actually go? Well, my understanding of the events um, was that um, there were two kittens uh, that tested positive with the initial test that we used. And um, they were euthanized, and one was sent for the crime scene to UGA. Um, <clears throat> Other cats that had come into uh, contact with these kittens were quarantined. And we don't have you know, hermetically sealed areas. It's, a, it's an area that is separate from the others. Um, something I've come to understand is that um, even if vaccinated, it can virus can be outside of the cat. Um, so it may not be affected itself, but it could have it on the outside. And so. This is my limited understanding of this type of thing. So they were quarantined. Um, I'm not sure if staff knew that a preliminary report was coming back or they were going to wait the full two weeks to get the crops report. Um, it's my understanding that, that the shelter, uh, the animal control administrator, made the decision after consulting with the Department of Agriculture. Uh, I, I believe I was told that they also talked to the Madison County. No. 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 Okay. No. <laughs> so, um, that's a lot. Okay. Well, I'm trying to explain that. So, okay, this is what I was told. And, um, sure. And so the um, decision uh, was done. So, so, 
Yeah. 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 Yeah
if we can't get their behavior to conform to better standards, is to get them in court so they can talk to the assistant county attorney who works with them and so they can talk to my students and me and we can actually try and find out their behavior. So Lisa, that's that's through UGA then? But yeah, it's UGA yeah. on and athletes Clark County have partnered on it. We have the uh, class once a month at the municipal courtroom and we're actually uh, hoping to make it open to the public generally, and so that's something that um, we're happy to help publicize and um, get people in. And we talked to the main side about them potentially even giving a discount on adoption, which would be $25 off for people who have completed this course because those people are slightly better adopters, we think. Ideally, there would be some relationship with animal control like that, too, where people who have completed the course could you know, get some incentive on the animal control and if they come as adopters. So that's oh, that's awesome part. partner with uh, Annette. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, so, just to follow up, and I think I, I, I first want to say I've never tried it before. So, I'm very sympathetic to the fact that we're, we are on a mission here to try and, and solve what, what has been the more apparent problems that are going on uh, at the shelter and animal control in general. Uh, and, and I applaud that. I really do. And I'm hopeful that, that this is going to be something that really does lead us to have. The, the best animal control, animal services in, in the state, possibly a uh, shining example in South. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, so I, I, I hesitate somewhat to come back to the past, but there's a couple of things I'd like to at least kind of just get out of the table. And um, when it comes to the statement that came out before uh, the August 29th statement, when we start talking about the shelter. Uh, uh, basic statement was like, hey, you know, we've done what we thought was best. But it, it, it's kind of troublesome to think that we really are still dancing around whether that was the right or the wrong thing to do. Um, so, I mean, uh, ultimately, the, uh, the results weren't waited for from EJ Labs. There was no, no attention to doing so. And it's not like the shelter administrator didn't know that. The, 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 the labs were going out there. Um, there were cats that were already vaccinated. You had medical isolation facilities that weren't properly utilized. Uh, you know, and that was paid for by the SLOS 2011. Um, no real veterinary resource was actually contacted uh, to get an opinion on, it, you know, is this what we should be doing? You have the resource of, of, of Janet at, at, at the Fairy Humane Society who basically continues to write the book on shelter management. Uh, incredible resource just sitting there. It's not unknown to animal control, not contact. Knowing all that now, and everything that we've actually talked to about the stakeholders you're meeting with right now, does the county still believe that the shelter administration acted appropriately? And also to, to piggyback on, on what Sherry was saying, did that, did that decision ever get up to David Flop? Did it go past him? Were you aware of it at the time that it was happening? I was told when it happened. Okay. Um, I, I was told there was an outbreak. I let the commissioners know about it. Um, you know, I, I don't know if David made the call or Michelle made the call. I didn't make the call. Um, and obviously, in hindsight, things could have been done a lot differently. And that's that's kind of what we're focused on while we're getting involved. Because ultimately, it's my job to make sure that things are managed well. And so that's what we're going to do from here on out. And you're not going to see, well, you should not see any repeats like that because we're going to be focused. So, just to follow underneath that, some of the frustration that I've really experienced, and obviously you've heard enough from me already, probably have gotten this kind of hint from me, is that um, where I know that it probably felt incumbent upon the government to try and soft pedal the story, or at least soften the message that was coming out after this all happened. Um, the, the information that the public received was uh, not genuine at best. And I, I'm hoping that you can commit to making sure that we get a little bit more of a frank discussion from, from the county going forward so that we can all be able to participate fully in, in trying to respond to that. We, we don't want to tear you down. We want to build the shelter up. Absolutely. And, and I appreciate your comments. And you know, as time goes by, you know, we learn more. And so um, I understand now, you know, some of the mistakes that were made, and they were made, and we're going to manage those going forward with the advice, insight, transparency of our partners. There should be a pan loop policy. 
where there's a protocol that a veterinary resource is contacted and consulted about it that is documented, you know, so that it's what the lease's point, you know, there's an explanation as to what happened and why. And that stuff needs to happen before there's a, a decision that's to, right. to, I think that's what, I mean, that's how I, I yeah. want to know that that's not going to happen again, where there is an animal Well, I mean, although they might have to say is that the whole, if you can't see, uh, if you can't see that that series of events was just a series of, of bad decision making, or at least just uh, a series of terrible mistakes, if, if the county can't kind of just come out and be able to say that, like it's kind of like Fonzie trying to say he's wrong. We need you to actually just at least be like that was bad, and, and we're never going to let that happen. And that would be kind of a relief. I mean, there has to be a formal apology. Well, I, I will say that, that the, you know, hindsight reveals mistakes, and if the evidence that, that Josh and I are fully committed and involved in dedicating hours to improving it, that that doesn't speak to the fact that improvement is needed. I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, we're working. Yeah. And uh, I'll say that, I mean, the commission, along with staff, had some very frank conversations, and I think, you know, we're committed to make sure this, that, uh, this is transparent as we move forward. Um, I, we're taking this I think, very seriously. And, and Barry, it's, it's an extremely unfortunate issue that we've got to this point. I think we have, we all admit that. Um, yeah. So I've got you, sir, and then I'll come to you, Paula. So um, as we all know, like last year, something very similar happened, right? Uh, so last year, Patrick Reeves was the animal control superintendent. Michelle Carey was the supervisor of animal control when the shelter was shut down by the Georgia Department of Ag for its lack of care for the cats, basically. Um, I understand that Patrick was then shifted to a GIS analyst position within the county, and Michelle was then promoted to head of the shelter. Um, were either of them held accountable for the deaths of the 69 cats last year, and if so, how? And lastly, how is Michelle being held accountable for her actions and role in this year's issues? Well, you know, there's there's a personnel matter involved. You're talking about people here, and um, there's a human resources component to that that I can't speak to. And that's not trying to be uh, withholding information. There is, you know, some medical issues involved that I can't talk about. Okay? Why yeah. not? It's confidential, yeah. personnel, yeah. HR, and there's legal protections in place. I can assure you that there's not um, this acceptance of mediocrity and, and giving people push jobs or anything like that. There, there were reasons why that had to happen. And you just have to trust me on that. What had to happen? That Patrick was um, transferred. Okay. But why yeah. would you trust the anything that you're trying to say? I mean, dude, like the, the statement that he just talked about was full of falsities, or like at best half truths, like he said. Like the county had their your reputation is severely damaged from this in my eyes for for certain. And obviously in a lot of people here that don't care about these animals and what's happened. And you guys owe us the people that you, like the commission. I think is taking great strides. Like I commend you guys for taking steps in the right direction, but saying you're doing it and actually doing it are two very different things. And I'm honestly just fed up with it. And it, like, I mean, we have an entire organization dedicated to this problem that is formed because of the lack of transparency by your administration and the people that are involved. Well, I understand that, and I get it. And, and it's much like with the stakeholders. You know, there's erosion of trust over time. Um, you know, I'm new on the scene, and you're going to have to afford me a little bit of trust, like I'm going to have to afford you a little bit of trust. And 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 as these two ladies were, were, were in a nascent relationship, you know, moving forward, um, all I can do is make good decisions, and you see them happen. And over time, you know, we'll get the trust back, and we'll hopefully create a model organization. Yeah. And I, I hear you. I mean, it is a thing about trust, about community trust, and I can tell you at least this. I mean, the I guess the connection there is that 
do you all get to elect the commissioners and you need to make sure that you're electing commissioners that are going to uh, make sure staff is doing these changes, putting these changes in place. And I can tell you this, this commission is, and the mayor is committed to it. Um, we hear y'all, we see these issues. Um, I am extremely, both my animals, well, one of my past actually, but my, my cat is also a rescue man. This, this, I, I, I get this, and I, I think a lot of the commissioners do. And um, I mean, we're committed, and um, I've had conversations with Man Williams, and I believe he is also committed to understanding that mistakes were made and committing ourselves to reversing that and earning the trust of this community. Because especially when it comes to animal services, we rely on this community so much to, do, to volunteer and do so much work. So we need y'all. This has to be a partnership. And I hear you on that on that breach of trust, and I think that we're just trying to. Part of what we're here tonight is trying to mend that bridge so that we can come back together. I get that it might take some time, and I understand that. I think that's 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 real. Um, but um, I think we're all trying. And I've made some recent steps to start rectifying management issues. I continue to do that. Um, okay, so on that, um, Paul, I'll go over with yours. Okay, um, I was on the original board of directors for the Madison Open Floor Animal Shelter. I'm a veterinarian also. Um, we spent seven years raising money to get that built. It wasn't easy. But during that se those seven years, we went and visited a bunch of different animal shelters. Ones that we, one, yeah, ones that we found, you know, good things, and we adopted that. We found another good thing at another shelter. We adopted that. I designed the surgery suite. It, and it, oh, thank you. Anyway, that's one point. The other point is, as a veterinarian, I'm expected, I'm required to do continuing education, a certain amount of credits every couple of years. And the last um, maybe four or five, six years, I've noticed at the conferences that I attend, there is a whole day of animal shelter. Um, sessions now. They didn't used to be when I first graduated. It's becoming more, um, you know, it's becoming more information for people that are in the shelter business, if you want to say business. And so I, I think that that might be a good way to get some more information about how to do things right in what we're trying to do here. There's also a magazine called Animal Sheltering that I get, and that would be another source to have available to whoever wants it. So those are just some ideas as far as educating the people that are going to work there, volunteer there, or just to be aware as citizens here. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to speak to y'all's points um, about accountability um, and that audit should really uncover you know, some the root of the issues and um, point out that accountability. Um, having an outside objective deep dive into what actually happens and presenting it publicly <coughs> will address that. Um, I also, speaking of veterinarians and in, in vets in UGA, um, we have a world class veterinary teaching hospital here. I know I emptied out my savings account. <laughs> 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 um, I spent a lot of time there. I'll be back in the um, And I know those, I mean, that place is swarming with students. I know those students have certain residency requirements and things like that. Do we have any kind of relationship and can we pursue a formal relationship with UGA? That's the only get interns in there. Just actual veterinary experience in our shelter. That's something that they're working on now. Is what we're doing, and that's a good idea. Are, are they uh, have been they been sitting on these meetings? All these partnership meetings? All anybody from that? Uh, no, no. The only person with an affiliate in the UK would be decent. Uh, but that's certainly we can widen the net there. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, I, want to go, I can speak to that for one minute. Yeah, I'm I'm a charter from Clark County, so I'm very familiar with the, with the history there. And we used to they used to have their shelter medicine program at UGA. And Dr. Janet Martin was in charge of that at that time. And she weekly brought vet students in. But since they canceled that program, I, mean, I don't think UGA has been back in any formal. So they're starting it up again. And actually, one of the things I want to talk to Dr. Legato about before we leave here tonight is uh, now that he's coming to the shelter once a week to help with rabies vaccinations and stuff, whether or not that's something that's integrated with the Shelter Medicine Club. Um, 
Anyway, I'm putting you on the spot, but I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> but we're trying, we're trying something. And like, so to, you might want to contact University of Florida as far as going back to the question about the TNR cats, because the vet school at University of Florida has a that huge program where they do for the whole community and the veterinary medical students will set up like once a month or every few months. They bring a hundred plus cats at those events and they allow the vet students and the community to come in to volunteer and they do spay and neuters for low cost or free. And that's experience that veterinary medical students, the third years and fourth years, really need if put some kind of hardship like that with the county and Dr. Nolan to get her involved to potentially do something like that. That's great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael in the back. I know some of y'all, if you've already have one question, I'm just going to put that at the bottom of the list and people have it yet. Okay, uh, I have experience. Uh, with uh, providing care for abandoned animals. My family owns property in a neighborhood that 10 years ago was funded by county government, a feral cat colony off North Chase Street. Some of y'all remember that battle at the commission. Uh, we won and lost, the funding got pulled, and we've been dealing with the aftermath of that in the five years that we've owned property in the neighborhood. It went from 40s, 46 feral cats to about 16, and now there's about eight. So, uh, and then also I work, uh, I work as a community advocate. I, I just happen to have been working with Stephanie Maddox, internal auditor on non-confidential affairs of her office for almost a year now. And I'd just like to point up, raise a couple quick points, okay? is uh, first of all, the audit committee has done a uh, great job helping transform that committee and that audit uh, and, 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 and the auditor's role over the past six months. They worked very hard, okay? And other commissioners, including Commissioner Denson, have advocated for her powers to be restored to her office. But I do want to point out on this vote on Tuesday, next Tuesday at City Hall, there's already significant pushback from a sitting commissioner to limit the scope of the audit if approved by the entire commission. Uh, this is uh, not Blaine Williams' problems. This has been going on for at least 10 years, and now I guess he has to deal with it, but they're trying to limit the scope of the audit on several counts, including the budgetary concerns. And I just want to quote from uh, the website, athens Clark County website, the role of the auditor is to conduct a continuing internal audit of the fiscal affairs and operations of every department op office and agency of the United Government. So this office has been prevented from looking at budgetary concerns for a long time. So I'm asking y'all that y'all do not take Tuesday, October 1st for granted the very last thing I'm going to say, and thank you so much for your time, uh, Ms. Maddox has an extensive history in medical science and medical terminology. It was related to human, uh, human studies, but she is going to be able to grasp and understand what the veterinarians and what the other experts are talking about. So I'm asking y'all uh, not to feel like that the, 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 the audit is a done deal. Uh, we need y'all to speak to the commissioners and not limit the scope of the audit. Uh, audit. <coughs> you had the question, you still have one? Uh, yeah, I guess it's going back to the antique cats. Um, you know, I think that the vet school and 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 the vet school are the people that were involved in the bad decisions both last year and this year that were put in the same decisions, are they still in charge? And if they are, then how am I supposed to believe that 
is really being taken care of. Because I'm saying, as an employee, as someone who had to deal with that, I didn't believe anything was being taken care of until that manager was removed from their position. Well, I'm involved in oversight now. I'm not a person removed from it. And so everything is in plain sight. Josh Edwards is our, you know, going forward, uh, manager's office is involved directly. So we're going to be watching, we're going to be learning, we're going to be becoming educated as to what best practices are, and we're going to hold those And the, the current manager, well, well, the previous manager of social services has now resigned, which this was under. So, yeah. But the, but the people responsible for making the decisions are still in position to make decisions. So that cool for me, and I'm sure a lot of people. To, to know that someone who made a decision that bad and that consequential could, is still in a position of power and a position to make decisions, it it really just kind of erodes. I mean, everything you're saying, it sounds great, but it, it includes the but. It, it makes the but the capital letter. Like, is this really... It sounds good, but is it really going to happen? Or is something going to happen before, you know, the decisions get put into effect? I just, I don't have confidence in management that has shown that multiple times they can make this type of decision and they'll still be in power. Or, I just, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't sit well. I mean, the shelter now on a day-to-day -day basis, what, which person is now the well, Michelle Carey is still um, the supervisor. That's, I mean, that's, I don't want Why to is she still there? Well, I would just, you know, I hear you. I ask for your patience. Um, you trust the process. I'm responsible for the management. It's not going to do me any good to, to have people making bad decisions going forward. And I just ask you for some time. And... You yeah. had a year and a half. Like this happened a year and a half. Like I said, I came here to share my thoughts with you. And so. so in office, in your head? Yes. Um, not in office, but I was a manager here and I helped you do this. Okay. Um, right. we, have, I have, uh, we only have a few minutes left. We've got four more, so that's going to be all the questions. I think I got people down. Um, uh, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so you stated earlier that one of the goals is to protect animals from inhuman treatment. Um, so I don't think a lot of people will know this, but a lot of volunteers are so see a lot of things that happen. Um, but staff doesn't always sedate the animals before they actually euthanize them. Um, and it's not a requirement by the county to do that. Um, if you don't know, um, if it's an IV, staff doesn't sedate them. Um, and euthanasia serum is actually really painful, um, especially if you go out of Maine, which often happens because they're not properly trained. Um, and so why is it not mandatory for euthanasia if there's so many that can fix that moving forward? So we actually are doing humane treatment of the animals that are in our care. Well, that seems like a reasonable question. Um, again, I'm learning, um, and I would look to Lisa and Jane to help advise us on what those best practices are. Um, I do that in lots. The I euthanasia for any kind of research setting or for any animal care guidelines. Um, you can go on the IVMA website, American Veterinary Medical Association, and that is what is actually the standard for euthanasia, and it will list the species and what is actually allowed. Well, yeah. and, and developing euthanasia protocols um, for that situation is one of the top couple priorities I brought up last week, so I'm, I'm hopeful that that is being prioritized. Yeah, it's about a sure. hundred plus pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah, they are the yeah. absolute authority. That's yeah. even in a research setting too. They troll the I cook, you know, public health policy. Do they, I do they that say that the standard should be that they're sedated before they're euthanized? It doesn't say that. It depends on the type of euthanasia being done, and it, in practice with vets, it very much depends on the competence of the people doing the euthanasia. And so I would like Janet or another vet to be working with the shelter, given the limitations of the, of the staff themselves and their abilities in developing a protocol that is humane. 
So there's a marked difference between animal clinic euthanasia and shelter euthanasia. A vet does it at an animal shelter. Staff does it at a that does it at a private clinic and, a, and staff does it at animal Yeah, clinic. sorry, that's what I meant. So but, there, there's a difference. But isn't staff trained to euthanize? They're certified to euthanize, but that means that they can draw blood. So legal, they're legal. I'm not, that's not the concern. They're complying with the legal requirement that a vet says, yes, you're competent to draw blood, but that's different than under a pressured situation necessarily doing it well at any moment. I, <clears throat> euthanasia is not easy for anyone. Um, and I think that that's a very different situation when somebody who cares for the animal is now euthanizing it for pain or for space or for whatever reason. And so I think we need a vet to be coming up with, if you have a new staff, what's your rule? There's two stick rules, for example. Like if you can't hit the vein at two tries, you're done. That's one approach. And so I think, this is something we've talked about that I would like to see prioritized, but with a vet overseeing it, not necessarily the minimum standard, but what would you want to see in your play? Thanks. Um, so you mentioned the former manager, and I think you made a great move there. Um, I would point out that the problem here has been a culture of mediocrity uh, where good employees, and I can point to several people here who are excellent animal employees who were driven out. Some of them, several of them are now directors of shelters in the surrounding area. Okay. And when things were being done that they knew were wrong, okay, then Patrick shut them down, and then David shut them down, and when they went beyond that to human resources in the past, I can't speak to recent experiences, they were shut down very forced for Harry Owens, for example. So I, I think you might want to think about uh, trying to implement a culture where county employees who are actually doing the real work you know, uh, have some cred, <laughs> you know, some credibility with the group. And, uh, and you don't just have this reflexive protection of management that you know, if you rock the boat, you're out, right? Okay. And you know, over all of this, I think that that's been a has, and I can't speak to recent experience. Um, we've been out of the county for a few years now, but that was a huge problem. Uh, you could not criticize, you know, in a constructive or helpful way. You couldn't make any suggestions. You couldn't volunteer. You know, the outreach program was shut down because Patrick thought that was too much trouble for him. Um, my wife here, Christy, who was the former supervisor, you know, ran, uh, she had a, a, you know, a, a spay neuter clinic where I think it was a humane society brought in a big RV thing. And then she was told she couldn't even use the county phone. There, she had to use her personal phone and do all of that on her own time. Well, this is ancient history. Uh, but I think it's important to have a culture throughout human resources where people can bring up legitimate complaints and they're not just shut down and stepped on and kicked out the floor. Because your people are your best resource. I couldn't agree more. And, um, and all three of the people that you named are not in the organization anymore. And uh, for maybe some of the longer serving commissioners who were here before, I think that that sort of top-down control approach, at least under my administration, is soft and soft. Um, it needs to be addressed here. As I said, Josh just spent the last couple of days talking to all the staff, actually last week too, every one of the members of the staff to hear what their concerns were and some ideas from moving forward. And we're going to continue that discussion. Um, so, again, I know it's maybe not much from where you guys have been, but we're moving forward and, you know, watch what we're doing. Oh, great. This is a great county. We've got great community. I totally agree. You just need to listen to them. Yeah, yeah. All right, last question. Thank you. Um, so I understand that there are some serious changes being made, like the shelter is no longer under central services, and we no longer have David Fluck, and I, obviously these are all really good efforts. Um, and my question is about the hiring process going forward. Like, Yes, we have Josh, who's an interim person, overseeing the shelter. Um, 
when the county, um, the process for hiring the person who will be permanently in the position, to what degree can stakeholders be involved? Like that could be a way to maybe restore some trust that has been destroyed. Um, can stakeholders be involved? Can they have a say? Like, I understand that it's a government position, it's a government hiring process, but is there any potential to include stakeholders in any way? Well, I certainly um, invite, you know, much like I did with the police chiefs, some input on the characteristics, you know, the, the, the training, education, what you would expect in the animal services profession. Um, and I've hired, I think, 14 people in this three and a half years I've been here. We've had a lot of turnover due to retirements or, you know, we're sort of a middle market and a lot of our folks are really top notch and they go on to bigger and better things. Um, so um, I've made some good hires. It's in my best interest to make good hires and have the right people in where they need to be and that we're still working through that. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested to hear what y'all would like to see in the new panel services group. Okay. Uh, we're about at the end here. Um, first off, I want to thank uh, just Lisa and Jane and Lane for spending your evening with us like this. Um, <laughs> uh, for, and taking this issue so seriously and making sure that, that we get it right. Uh, I want to thank all of y'all for being here, for being passionate about this issue, for advocating for it. Um, I tell you, we are listening to you, um, we are concerned with you, and I, I hope that uh, that we earn your trust back as we go through this process. Um, it is going to take some time, but we invite you to be a part of it as much as you can. Uh, this Thursday will be a big step uh, with the vote, with the, the vote on the audit also, so that's at 6 p.m. at City Hall um, on Tuesday, the 1st. You know, definitely welcome to be there and also public comment available there too. So with that, thank you so much, and I appreciate you guys. Have a great night. Thank you.